All right, welcome everyone to Thursday of National Distance Learning Week with SUNY Online. I'm gonna be your moderator today. Just uh, some housekeeping items for those that joined the live session to keep mics muted. We'll have a Q&A at the end and you can type questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, I am thrilled to introduce our speaker today. We have Dr. Nicole Child Rose with us. Dr. Child Rose serves as an Associate Professor of History, Co-Chair of Technical Professions Division and Academic Assessment Chair at Columbia Green Community College. As a dynamic educator, she focuses on inclusive design and delivery of courses, student-centered instruction and authentic assessment to encourage student success for diverse learners. Nikki is passionate about bringing history to life for her students. She is a board member of the SUNY Council on Assessment and has recently been appointed to, uh, to SUNY's FAC2 Council, where she's a member of the Inclusive Teaching and Social Justice Assessment Working Groups. She's also a 2017 SUNY Online Teaching Ambassador. And when she's not teaching and learning, she enjoys horseback riding, working on the ranch with her husband and her cow dog. Thanks for joining us, Nikki. Thanks for having me. Thanks for that introduction, Erin and I'm just really delighted to be here and be part of National Distance Learning Week and carve out some time in, you know, what's been definitely a busy semester to just reflect a little bit and hopefully inspire others uh, through sharing my story uh, about how their course could be envisioned as potentially a high flex course. And for me, the journey to transitioning a few select uh, courses that I already was teaching into a high flex modality um, has been a journey of ups and downs, but is something that I care deeply about because I feel like it's really providing opportunities for students to take courses that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to. And I feel like it's in all been a great opportunity to connect students that wouldn't have had opportunities to get out into their communities and apply what they're learning and really be immersed in their experience. So um, I'll just jump right in and I'd welcome anyone who joins the session to just feel free to post in the chat uh, going along any questions that you have, as Erin said, and also just I would love to hear about what you are doing on your campuses, and I'll share a bit more about that at the end of our 45 minutes together. So I thought about, you know, when putting all the pieces together of my journey, just what my goals were in, you know, delivering this presentation, and Again, I think top of my list would be, you know, there are a lot of doubters about the high flex modality. And even though it's really not as new as it may seem, and it could, can be very new for some people on certain campuses, it's been around for a little while. And it was something that I had always wanted to try, but it was really the pandemic that allowed me to try it and pilot it. And that's just what we did. We began uh, offering a few high flex courses as a pilot, and now it's going to become a thing that will will hopefully stay around. Um, so I hope above all, you know, that sharing my story just may inspire others to at least just try it and assess it and and even think about if it could be right for them. And I always really am welcoming of community feedback and networking. Columbia Green is a fairly small campus, um, and we have right now under a dozen faculty who are um, part of the pilot and are teaching high flex. So it's a very small number of us, and especially just drilling into history and political science as a discipline. There are few of us, and, and I really hope that I can connect with others who are trying out uh, similar things. And it's a time, I think, of great challenge for uh, history in general. You know, we are being asked to do a lot and to really rethink our courses, whether it's with gen ed assessment uh, and development of learning outcomes, whether it's enrollment challenges. So I really do want to, I hope, leverage sharing my story to promote history courses because they really can be a great fit for the high flex modality. I don't certainly think that every course or every discipline or even content area may fit the modality well, but for me, history has, has worked out. Um, and then just to explore 
you know, the design elements, the key considerations, you know, lessons learned for um, successful implementation. It can be a juggling act, but I think it all goes back to design. And so I'll just share some strategies that I'm using that I feel are working fairly well and maybe share what hasn't worked so well. I am also really proud to be part of the IITG SUNY project. Um, this has been an opportunity that began over the summer for me. I had already been teaching high flex since 2021. Uh, so I am really trying to use that as an opportunity to um, increase community college student engagement because through my participation in that project, I've been able to bring even better technology to our campus. And that experience has connected me with others throughout the SUNY system who are doing similar things. So that's just been a great opportunity. And I would feel remiss if I didn't, you know, pay that forward. And then finally, um, just I think I would really hope to allow others to understand the complexities of teaching in this modality and layering that with the social justice component. My intention in um, moving these horses to, to high flex modality is to just ensure that everyone is getting an opportunity to learn in an immersive, involved, engaged way and a meaningful way. And also layered onto that is uh, how I've used these courses to really encourage students to um, think about applying history lessons to issues that we're facing now as a community. So whether it's just applying their knowledge, skills, values, um, projects that they're doing in course in the courses to just go out into their communities, connect with others, and even develop action plans or reflective journals. So I'll share some of those artifacts. Um, in terms of the social justice civic engagement component. So just to kind of start off um, and some key questions to consider jumping into this that I spent a long time actually thinking about. I think, you know, during the pandemic, I was like, how will I meet these enrollment challenges? How will I still offer an array of courses um, with fewer students, some students that aren't able to come to campus, some that really want to. So I just kind of started out thinking about and reflecting on my own teaching style, my philosophy of teaching. And for me, I was really ready for this because I had taught courses online for over a decade. Um, I felt like, you know, the, the courses that I would be selecting would be appropriate, but also with my my teaching style, which is very flexible, adaptable. I felt like this was something I was really ready for, but I would encourage anyone to think about your teaching style and think about, you know, if that would be a frustrating experience for you or if it could work with your style. And I, in thinking about that, kind of talked with some other colleagues who were also early adopters of this and we just had some great discussions about our teaching styles and ideas that we might try in our courses. So that was also really helpful in just thinking through if this would even be something I wanted to do. I also thought about the courses that I would be able to teach and would they be a good fit? Would they be compatible? Um, would the learning objectives that were already existing fit you know, and would I be able to assess student learning? So I really just kind of sat down with my course materials and it was an excellent time actually to do all this because we were moving as a campus from Blackboard to Brightspace. We were a cohort one campus and that journey was starting around the same time as uh, the conversations around, you know, alternative modalities. So I, I do see something in the chat. So I'll kind of come back to that. Thanks, Erin. I'll, I'll be sure to look at that. And I do want this to be hopefully an interactive session. So I hope that as I'm sort of sharing these open-ended questions, maybe something is inspiring you or something's come to mind that you've thought about and you're not sure about how to navigate in terms of your courses or, or you know, your campus um, tools, support, et cetera. So I had a chat actually with a few colleagues, um, a colleague who teaches communications and a, a business 
um, professor at our college. And we all sort of just talked through artifacts from our courses, um, activities that we plan to do. And I thought, you know, hey, they have some really great ideas. I might also want to try those in my high flex. Um, so that, you know, I seem to check off like those two boxes. And then, you know, the third thing and, and definitely the most important thing was just taking a deep dive look into who my students are and what their needs are. And I place this really at the top because even though I started as a personal sort of conversation with myself, the big thing for me was would this work for my students? And we didn't have, you know, any benchmark um, data to kind of go on. So I did have a meeting with our executive team and our institutional research and planning team. And I just took a look at, you know, who students in the three courses that I would be selecting, which I'll share more about, who they really were, kind of disaggregating that data. And I realized that a lot of students were working well beyond like even a national average, you know, working not one, but maybe two jobs. Um, students tended to be uh, younger, actually, in two of the courses that I would be teaching. So kind of out of high school, probably because these were 100 level history courses. But then in another course, uh, the, the average age of students was older. Um, and then just in terms of, you know, academic needs, the programs that they were interested in, scheduling was another thing that I was, you know, really interested to look at. Um, so I think, you know, above all, that really drove my decision and I decided to take a leap and, and to try this out. So um, I would like to just encourage, you know, anyone um, either watching this recording or taking part in this to think about your own goal setting path. And uh, just to begin with, like, what would motivate you or what would excite you about teaching high flex? And I'll definitely share that, uh, you know, for me, my, my top list. I think I have a list of about a dozen things that excited me. And for me, it was a long time actually coming to be able to actually offer the high flex courses. I had um, presented this like actually back before the pandemic in like 2016 and 2017, but our campus wasn't ready to try it, to take that leap. And uh, something I actually learned in the fellowship experience over the summer was that the opposite experience was true for a lot of faculty, kind of the decision to implement the top down. For Columbia Green, it came from uh, faculty like me who were just excited about this. Um, so moving on to just share what excited me, uh, probably most above all was to just provide a learning experience that was accessible for anyone. So I'll share what our um, adopted definition of high flex is, but you know, I love just full participation in my courses. So I like to teach a large class whenever possible. Um, I'll also share numbers, but this was about just bringing anyone together that wants to learn. And most of the courses that we selected, actually all of them, our courses that you know fit a general education requirement. Um, so there was a little bit of intention there about also making it possible for students to uh, get those requirements that they need. This also aligned perfectly well with the launch of our new history concentration, which was in a fledgling stage um, back in 2019. And we want to think about, you know, just uh, kind of marketing that as a flexible concentration um, and a great a great way for students to jump in or put their toe in the water uh, of history and political science. So I do think that the flexible modality has helped enrollments in that program, but also made a, a very meaningful experience. I also wanted to leverage existing courses that I was comfortable teaching in other modalities. So I had already taught um, Western Civ and U.S. History 1 and 2 uh, as hybrid, as fully online, as traditional in-person. So I felt really comfortable and had a lot of, you know, materials to work with already. 
I also wanted to leverage or optimize the flexibility during what was very uncertain conditions. So I felt like things were constantly changing about who would be allowed on campus versus not, about social distancing, class size, how the schedule would roll out. So I felt like this actually gave me control um, over a lot of things that were beyond my control. And also, you know, that carried through to students because this was set as a high flex. They knew that they had basically three options or any variation of those options to attend this class. So that gave them some stability and some certainty during a whole bunch of uncertainty. Um, I was also really excited about the challenge to design a memorable, engaging, worthwhile experience. And I'll talk more about, you know, the design because for me, it all started with design. Uh, it was also an opportunity to start to grapple with general education requirements. Uh, we're a small department of few and, you know, there's kind of an overhaul going on uh, uh, with history right now. So this was a way for us to think through that, to change learning outcomes where they needed to be. And this was also an official way to pilot HyFlex as a modality. And I'm happy to say that we are out of pilot mode now and entering a phase where we'll just be assessing this. Um, it has a solid definition. It's listed as a modality of choice. And I hope that there are more and more faculty who you know, are willing to try and also assess this as a modality in their disciplines. And the final thing that, again, aligned perfectly with the timing of this was to assist students with transition to our new digital learning environment. So I felt like if students were worried about the transition recently this fall to Brightspace, they could take this course as a high flex and get to have like really guided interaction with the digital learning environment, they could choose to attend some in person. And actually students shared with me that this gave them a lot of confidence to maybe try to take classes online that they wouldn't have taken before. So I think that's interesting and um, I think was a, a really great, possibly unintended outcome um, of this modality. So in terms of the social justice civic engagement component, I would like to encourage people to reflect on and think about and just also discuss within their departments, you know, what barriers to immersive learning currently exist in courses that you teach. And there was a lot of them. So when I was sitting down with colleagues talking about barriers, you know, student transportation was a huge thing for us. We don't have housing we're a commuter campus. Um, students are stressed about getting to class on time, uh, about their schedules, because they have so much going on on their plates. Um, so one of the beauties of HyFlex is you can kind of eliminate those stressors in a lot of ways. And as long as you're creating a very supportive, very engaged experience, um, I think that you can remove a lot of the barriers. Certainly not all. There's always barriers, the technology, um, but I also wanted to share one of the things that I have also done in these courses is to make them fully open educational resource courses. So all the materials that we're going to use throughout the semester are available at the beginning throughout the term for students to just use and return to and be immersed in and live with and reflect on and talk to their families about and go out in the communities and share about. And that way the course really becomes like a repository of just curated resources um, that they can access. And the same will be true. I'll talk about how I record the class sessions. And I find that students who even attend in person are going back and they're watching the recordings. And that really says a lot. So Kind of thinking about like what student engagement looks like in a history class, I think is similar to any class really. But for me, thinking about engagement, 
I want to see that students are involved. I want them to be interested. And let's face it, a lot of times students will take an intro history course because they have to. In fact, at Columbia Green, the largest you know, program that we have is nursing, second to maybe criminal justice. We have tech trades, um, you know, and psychology is a big major. So students kind of come like, I have to take this class, but I feel like they leave very interested to maybe even think about taking another history class. And that's that's what I really want to see, or I at least want them to realize a connection between what they're learning in history and maybe their criminal justice career or maybe their career in healthcare. That's a civic engagement piece of this as well. And I want students to be connected. And that was a huge fear that I actually had with the high flex. I didn't want in-person face-to-face students to feel disconnected from those that are choosing to watch the recordings and immerse asynchronously versus those who are remote. I really wanted to, to have a cohesive like class community. And I will admit that at first, in the first like iterations of offering the courses, I would have a challenge of maybe one or two students attending face-to-face in person and then the rest in the other modalities. But as time has gone on, I'm really seeing like a third, a third, a third split. And that's something I want to investigate a little bit more. But there were still ways, even with that one or two people in class, that we were able to come together and and connect. And I think that's ideal engagement. In addition, because the top three things on this list are are well supported in research, student engagement, you know, a literature review. These are pretty much involved, interested, connected, the top things. But for me, maybe less supported in the research, still there. But I really wanted students to remember the course or at least some of the topics long beyond the scope of the class. And I think that's a challenge in a survey history course because you're going through a lot of topics in a short amount of time. And I wanted students to apply what they were learning in the real world. And I think those two things can often go hand in hand. Um, And I wanted students um, to maybe think about or or be interested in considering taking another history course, maybe as an elective um, that they hadn't thought about taking before. So we offer some really great like 200 level courses that I was really hoping they might want to try. And actually that happened. So I'm really excited about that. Um, And Aaron said, that's interesting. I wonder what made the students select to attend in a different format. And I actually wondered that as well. And um, I'll kind of speak to that at the end because our next step now that we've moved out of pilot mode into like, this is a thing that's staying around will be how we assess this and, you know, ask students about their perceptions, about their decisions to attend um, and those sorts of things. So that's definitely something I can't fully answer. I can anecdotally answer, but it's really interesting to to think about. Aaron said, I always worry that too few will attend in one format. That's that's a real challenge. And it came up actually over the summer in the High Flex Fellowship that a lot of folks were experiencing that and that it's less ideal. And how do you deal with that? Because you don't want that one face-to-face student to just feel like singled out or you know, alone. Um, So it's, it's an interesting phenomena. And actually, my two colleagues are seeing the same trend sort of more face to face. And I think it kind of speaks to just conditions beyond our control, probably with the pandemic. Um, But I'm interested to just ask students like why they're choosing to attend how they how they are. So I wanted to just talk about the courses that we actually selected. And I say we because I didn't want to be like the only voice in this pilot, um, uh, unrolling this pilot. So in conversation with administrators, kind of gathered folks together. I think it's also important to include department chairs, any stakeholders. I even like to have any adjunct instructors who might, you know, think about doing this, be at the table to to discuss this. So we came up with some criteria for 
anyone who wants to try a high flex course, you would choose a course that's actually offered in multiple sections each semester because we wanted to have some comparative data. Um, we also wanted courses that were taught in both spring and fall semesters so that students could choose. Uh, and we wanted 100 level courses with no prerequisites. So that was our like three criteria. So it ended up being for me, not a huge pool of courses to actually choose from, but it worked out well because these were courses that I very regularly taught, was very comfortable teaching, and that usually had fairly for us large enrollments. So the courses ended up being, the first course was actually Western Civ II, uh, 1517 to present. And then we offered Western Civ I, and then uh, US History II will be offered in the future. So a couple of goes with Western Civ, and then I'm looking forward to offering US history this spring. Across the board for me, these classes were capped at 35 students and um, they did pretty much fill the smallest of the classes ended up being Western Civ one. And that's normal for us like that aligned with, even if we offered that in person or other modalities. For us, if we were to offer a course fully online, the cap would be, 18 or maybe squeezing 20 students in if I was open to that, which I would usually be. Um, so as you can see, this would allow more students to attend. And they did. Um, I think in the fall of 2021, actual enrollments were at about 30, um, teaching a class that's over max enrollment right now, and, and things are going very well. So this is, I think, a gem for if you want to be creative with scheduling. Um, you know, in a way, I guess there's a thought that you're actually teaching three separate courses within one, but I never thought about it that way. I really wanted to just reach as many students as possible during a very challenging time and try to grow the program and try to grow interest and be as accessible as we could be. So at Columbia Green, the next step was to come up with, okay, now we have these courses, how will we actually define the modality? So our definition in the catalog is that HyFlex offers students flexibility to attend class either on campus, remotely via live webcast, or as an online learner who may access course materials and lectures asynchronously. So any HyFlex class is coded this way, students see it in banner, they can talk with their advisors, uh, they get information on this modality and if it could be a good choice for them. And I think that's very important that they're fully aware of what they're getting into. Um, and it's really just about them choosing their learning path. And I picked up a great strategy and tool um, from the fellowship over the summer about how to ask students in the beginning and even weekly about how they're going to attend. So before classes begin, we have a preview week. And during that week, I ask every student to reach out to me um, in a form and I get their name, preferred name, and how they plan to attend for the first three weeks. And I let them know that they can change their mind at any time. But during those first three weeks, I want to know what to expect. And this helps me plan for the first three weeks. Um, whether I'm actually going to give handouts to those attending in person, anything that I would hand out, I also have as a digital copy online. It just helps me with the structure of the room that I'm in um, and, you know, just creating a space where I don't feel like surprise going in. I share that information with students who are attending because I don't want them to feel surprised either. So they all kind of know what to expect during that first week going in. Oh, thanks, Erin. Um, anything I think that's visual kind of demystifies what they're getting into. And um, there's actually some great visuals that are in Brian Beatty's book. So I'll share a reference list at the end that also help to sort of demystify uh, and allow students to visualize the learning path. So no surprises here. Everybody knows what to expect. It's clearly defined. And I think that's just so, so important for everyone. So obviously here, students have many options with the same end goal. And the 
real purpose of this is that all students, regardless of the path that they choose, will, will achieve or have the opportunities to achieve the same learning objectives by the end of the course. And that's the driving, the driving thing. So as you can imagine, there were many key challenges that had to be overcome, um, beginning with preparatory guidance. We do not have um, like a center for teaching and learning. We do not have a dedicated point person who is an instructional designer, um, but we do have amazing faculty. We do have uh, uh, very helpful administrators, and we really have a community culture at Columbia Greens. So I sat down with a few of the early champion colleagues and also included some people that didn't plan to teach high flex that I feel would have some really great ideas because they had taught hybrid courses or they taught in other locations um, and had some similar experiences. So we kind of came up with our own, like thinking through how we would prepare a faculty to think about teaching in this modality. And I think having preparatory guidance is key. It's something that I plan to like develop as we become more mature as a campus uh, doing this and creating and ma maintaining a community. So we put meetings on the books um, at the start of the semester so that at least the three of us piloting High Flex could like just debrief and support each other, ask each other how things were going. And then of course, just emailing each other uh, in between. And we wanted to make sure that students had uh, community as well and resources. So we have a program called Ready, Set, Go Online within that like orientation passport experience there's an area for students who are taking courses remote hybrid or high flex or in any of those variations of modalities um, to have just resources again to fully understand their experience know how to read the syllabi decode the language we just didn't want to assume that uh, everybody knew everything. So there is a lot of technical language and also just letting them know like what basic expectations would be as far as cameras and recordings available. And just that level setting I feel like was really important for us. So Lisa said GCC created a great high flex guide for their campus and uh, so Niagara adapted it and oh thank you. I would really appreciate that. I would love to see that. We also like the big thing was thinking through classroom technology. So we have come just light years since the pandemic on bringing classroom technology like up to speed and I think surpassing expectations. It really started with um, setting up. So we have a great AV team, kind of sat down with the team and talked about what I felt like I would need. Everybody that was teaching High Flex um, also, we kind of had varied needs and wants as far as the kind of microphones we would use, how we would be presenting visuals. But I ended up, you know, requesting an OWL tool, um, which really worked well. Now we have entire classrooms that are adapted and outfitted with like movable cameras and just great technology. Um, and I also add here the migration to Brightspace because that was kind of an over laying challenge on top of offering new modality that we would be migrating to a new LMS. So um, we just really communicated uh, through and through that to students. And, you know, I'm very proud to say that we're in Brightspace now. Um, I think for the most part, loving it, you know, maybe still navigating challenges as they come up, but it really is working well. We're also a Zoom campus, so we have Zoom integrated in our Brightspace, and that's just working really well as far as accessibility needs, um, posting recordings fairly easily and directly in the Brightspace um, course. Oh, thanks, Lisa. That's, that's great. I look forward to checking that out. In terms of course delivery, um, I think that this could look differently. We are using 15 week semester formats. I would love to see or try a shortened um, format actually because sustaining like the momentum for a 15 week uh, is a lot, but 
right now in that model, we're doing once per week live sessions and then activities spread out throughout the week. So this could be like discussions for my class. It can be reflective journals. It can be research and writing assignments. And the content is available all the time. So I make it very known to students that my expectation is they're working within the week that we're in. Um, but the content is available to them. So if they want to read ahead, they may. If they want to go back and read, they also may. And just looking at the statistics in my classes, um, that is very important for them to be able to have that access, I feel like. My colleague has a different style um, who's teaching communication that's working really well for her where she's rolling out the materials at the week that they start, but then they're available for students to go back to. So I think in terms of thinking through design, the delivery of how you will roll out a high flex course is also really important to just think about and strategize. For me, I'm going with one week is basically an era in history. So I'll share a slide in just a bit showing you what my course actually looks like. And as I alluded to before, just some basic technology needs are a robust digital learning environment. We're using Brightspace. Um, the first iteration of HyFlex I taught was in Blackboard. And I can honestly say the Brightspace just looks and feels just much more robust. The kind of feedback that I'm able to provide um, is really great and, and I'm kind of loving it. So um, I'm using, well, I started using an owl, um, which is like a camera that hoots when you turn it on and off and it covers the whole room. Now our classrooms are outfitted with a little bit different cameras that are moving and there's actual speakers in the room. Um, but this, the OWL honestly worked really well for me at first. And you, I needed a computer. I needed a basic projector that was kind of already there in the rooms I was teaching. And then just the video conferencing tool. So in the first go around, I was using Blackboard Collaborate. Now I'm using Zoom. And I'm very, very happy with that because I do from time to time have breakout groups. I will invite in-person students to bring either a mobile device or their laptop so that everybody can participate in those. Um, I do not break out groups by necessarily modality. Obviously, asynchronous students aren't part of a live group, but they're part of groups in discussions that are ongoing throughout the week. And I'll often group students who are face-to-face -face in person with someone who's remote. So that for me is part of like the inclusivity of the, the whole experience. Oh, thank you so much. Lisa's generously sharing link to slides from HyFlex workshop that you ran over the summer created within Brightspace. Thank you so much for sharing. That's great. And, you know, I don't know, Lisa, you could probably speak to if my experiences are aligning with what you see or if we're very unique in our experiences. No, you're you're telling me exactly what I hear from me and the folks that are trying to teach high flex on our campus. I think we're all experiencing the same kind of issues. Great. So I'm we'll, glad that we're not alone in it, though, that we are all on the same page. <laughs> I guess we navigate through together, you know, That's for sure. Um, so one of, I think the challenges for me, like to overcome also was just making my tech needs very well known. Um, so honestly, to do this, I literally like brought folks into the classrooms that I would be planning to teach in, because I think for someone who's not actually doing this, it's a little bit hard to envision and like imagine how this plays out. So I found um, Columbia had some really great visuals that I, I found myself like just drawing and sketching, but I, the most helpful thing was actually just bringing people into the classroom. And then they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense exactly what you need. And this was kind of like new territory for us in a lot of ways. So um, I would just encourage people to actually go into the room space, like try it out, live with it, you know, and, and it was really helpful for me to actually do this in the summer when things were a little bit quieter. And we had a lot of time to just prepare the, the room spaces. So right now we actually have, I think, like four classrooms 
that we recognize as like a high flex classroom or a remote teaching classroom that can accommodate you know, a large number of students because these are honestly large classes for us and that faculty are comfortable teaching in. So I have some similar kind of setup to this. I actually have movable tables because I do like to do a lot of artifact analysis, movable cameras that I can zoom in to cool artifact things. And um, then also, you know, if I want to break students apart or if we need to be more socially distanced, we can. I have a whiteboard that's very visible in the video and for the face-to-face -face students. And I'm usually sharing some sort of a slide deck, at least for a portion of class. And, you know, happy, to, it's always a great class when students choose to go on camera. I don't always have that. Not every day is like a great day, but um, for the most part, you know, students choose to go on camera, students are there in person. And we're using all the tools that we have, whether it's um, sometimes I'll flip the classroom and students actually get up and share slides or report out on something. Sometimes we're more using chat. And I'll share a little bit more about tactics that I use. I was really thankful also in the um, fellowship this summer to um, get some tracking tools. Like it can feel a little bit overwhelming to track how every student is attending. So I'm actually using this form to track attendance in my classes. It's just an Excel sheet and I can see who's attending in the classroom and, and otherwise, or if they're not attending at all. So in the case that a student's not attending, that means that they're not watching recordings or they're not participating in activities for that week. And then I'll be reaching out to them to just kind of follow up. Um, but I found this to be a helpful tool and it's something I'm happy to share with others. And we're actually going to be using this in assessing for the IITG uh, project at the end of this semester. Hi, Nikki, can I make a comment in relation to attendance? Yes. So, you know, we, we talked about this um, in our, our kind of high flex planning group. Um, there's about five or six of us to teach high flex and some multiple sections on campus. But we're still in our, you know, growing that kind of uh, flex modality. But when it came to attendance and they asked me, you know, what do I, what were my thoughts on taking attendance? And so I remember the first time I taught it, I was trying to do this. But students were choosing whatever modality worked for them. They were switching, um, you know, from, a, a, and I do believe what you said, how they start face to, some of them started face to face, but then they got comfortable. I mean, by the end of the semester, I had three that always came to class couple on Zoom and the rest were online. It was a shift through the semester. But, you know, since an, an, for a fully online asynchronous course, we don't, attendance isn't taken by, you know, showing up to class. It's taken by submissions. It's not by logins, it's by submissions. So we, we chose that since online is an option and regardless of what they needed to do, uh, even if they came to class or they Zoomed or they didn't come to class, they still had to submit their work in the online LMS. And so we did not take attendance at all. We only took attendance like we would as if it was 100% online. Mm -hmm. And it really streamlined the process and made it a lot easier because we were really trying, you're trying to keep track of all these folks. Like if your campus requires it, what our campus said that was absolutely fine, we could treat it just as it was a fully online course and do the same kind of attendance by submission within the LMS. Yeah, it's a great point. I'm I'm required as part of this project to take attendance oh, okay. in this I gotcha. way. Yep. But I totally like what you're saying is totally aligns with my experience. It's a challenge to really track it. I feel like it's important for me at this phase because I want to like deeply assess this and I'm participating in this. Um, but I defer to like what you're saying makes perfect sense from a practical standpoint. Um, and I agree. So for me, you know, I, and kind of to that point, it's about intentional course design, high impact activities, sure. a lot of opportunities for scaffolding and allowing students to hear many voices. That's part of the social justice component in, in my teaching as well. And I'm seeing that I'm coming up on time. So I just want to share like a couple more slides here. These are just actual artifacts from my courses. And I have a theme of five C's in history. These are recognized by the American Historical Association. And by the end of the course, students will have learned about change, context, complexity, 
causality and contingency. So I've just taken excerpts of um, course artifacts on how students are graded, how our schedule rolls out, the course description, um, and the learning outcomes just to share for folks. And happy to share any artifacts from any courses. Elements of design for me were um, about engaging every student and planning effectively. And I've already talked about the use of OER, flipping the classroom, recording the sessions. I feel like those are core elements of that ability to engage every student um, because it is about their choice. But it, it's also, for me, about bringing the course to life, traveling through time and place every class and making sure they're a part of that. And so to achieve that, um, I make sure that I'm not the only voice. I feel like diversity is a critical part of that delivery of meaningful content. One way I've been able to achieve that is through using some technology tools like Wakelet. Students at the beginning of the course write a letter to their future self about what they hope to learn. And then at the end of the course, they write a letter to their current self and they do weekly Wakelet posts in, in their reflective journal. And that really allows me to see how they're understanding the material and opportunities to provide formative feedback to them. They do a game changer paper in my class and it's an entire semester long research, uh, weekly discussions, and then self-assessments that are open notes and um, making the materials accessible is a huge part of this. Uh, lecture notes I post using Sway. That enables me also to track the depth of their read. I embed videos. I try to make it really active. There's questions embedded in the lectures in addition to our recorded class sessions. And this is actual look at what a class looks like. This is um, actually the US history course that I'm designing now. So it's based on weekly modules, very visual, calendar of upcoming deadlines, which is really important to communicate to students to keep everybody on the same page. So the civic engagement component, this will be the last slide that I share because I'm over time, is that um, in the course, I want students to examine past models of civic engagement, and they reflect on this throughout the course, and they actually future, and they explore how they'll respond to one issue of today. It could be labor, economics, um, participation in government, and they develop an action plan, or they even take action. So the course leads directly to internship opportunities, job shadow opportunities that we have honors or special projects, or if they're not going to go to that level, every student will at least submit an action plan. And I feel like this has been an amazing way, especially in high flex, to just bring everybody together, allow them to talk about what their plans are, um, and really wrap up the course in, in a great way. So I have a few slides that I'll include on what our future plans are in terms of assessing this now that we're out of pilot phase. Um, developing a community of practice is something I want to continue to do and um, continuing to market and communicate to uh, future students what HyFlex is like and can offer them. I feel like everyone has a unique learning journey. Every student matters. And um, in the end, that's really what, what matters to me. So I thank you for your time. And I see some stuff in the chat. So, oh, thanks so much, Lisa. And I look forward to seeing the, the materials that you shared and Aaron posted about slides and recordings available. Um, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. That was really great. There are so many just, you know, little tidbits in there that I'm like taking notes on over here. Um, and I always learned cool tools from people. You know, people sort of mention it's not the focus of your session, but it's always neat to see what tools people are using to kind it's of- It's funny, Erin. I just went to look at Wakelet Journal. Yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> I think it's so cool. And you never know you never what you'll know. get when you join these sessions. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And all these extra takeaways.
<laughs> Thanks so much, Nikki. We'll be sure to share your slides so folks can kind of take a deeper dive into some of that information. And um, you may already have it on there, but if you have your contact information on there, that'd be a great way for them to be able to network with you. For Definitely. My email's on like the second to the last slide. So I look forward to connecting with others. And thank you so much for having me. Sure.